So in this demo, it's going to be moving from a client to a server to microservices and eventually to Riff. I'm sure a lot of people came here to see Riff. Uh, this is from the developer's perspective. And the point of this is that if you can write a good function, then you can write a good function as a service. So we'll get to the function as a service at the end. All right, this is the demo app. OK, uh, it's called Bolarama. It is a <clears throat> example of the bowling kata that got, I got a little bit carried away. And <clears throat> so this is for if you are at a bowling alley and it closes down, right, before you're able to finish your game, you can go home and you can finish the game, OK? So make a new one. And this is your score from the bowling alley, right? And, and then you can keep rolling, OK? And these are all going to be you know, valid rolls based on what was rolled in the, in the last frame or in the last roll. Uh, <clears throat> it also validates. So if you have a bad game, right, and you go 0, 0, negative 1, that is not allowed, right? <laughs> and you can't have more than 10 in a frame. Uh, you can't have more than 10, and you can't have more than 10 in a, a roll, OK? So, but you can have a regular game, OK? And then you can, you can save one of these games, OK? And we can also load games um, that are <clears throat> already in the system. So if I load all the games, then the one that I just saved is right here, and I can continue with it, OK? All right, so this is what we have, and everything is working uh, very well, uh, but things will change. So um, this is uh, running with ClojureScript. I have a REPL where I can run my tests. If I say, uh, I apologize to anyone that can't see this. I'm going to try my best. So here are the tests for scoring, right? And you can see negative pins, more than 10 pins. So validation and scoring are being tested together because they're being used together. Right? When I try to get the score for a set of rolls, I either get a success with a number or uh, I get a failure with um, one or more errors. Right? And I represent that duality with the either monad that allows me to um, <clears throat> hand off the result of that calculation and defer making a decision on it until the time when I'm ready to make a decision, which in this case is HTML. Okay? If we look at the code, we have that, that pack, the scoring package is where all the interesting stuff is happening. This, these are the tests that you just saw, and this is my testing framework. It's just a, a quality comparison. If you are using pure functions, all you ever need to do is compare return values. It's testing some failure cases, testing some happy paths. Uh, this is the function that is being tested. Uh, I jammed it all into one function that isn't all that readable, but uh, you can still sort of see what it's doing at the bottom here. And before actually running the score, we validate the game. That returns an either as well, right? which can be flat mapped uh, with this other function. So in the end, you wind up with um, success or failure, and that can be handed off until someone is ready to make a decision about it. So <clears throat> we realized that everything's going well. Uh, we're starting to get competition in the, um, in the unfinished bowling game market. And uh, someone in the business department decided that um, this algorithm is our competitive advantage, and we can't be shipping it to the browser. So we need to move it to the server. The, the way we're going to do that is just by moving the files. So this is a package that runs on the browser. This is a package that will make a jar. Uh, and we can deploy that jar on the JVM. So this is Clojure script, but we really want Clojure. I'm not moving this either, because um, we need that representation of success and failure on both the server and the client. Okay. Uh, the idea is that we're going to uh, represent the result of our scoring with that either, and it needs to be passed along until the point we're ready to make a decision about it. So it needs to go from the server to the client and then uh, turn into HTML. So not moving that one, um, but moving these other ones, and we need to turn them into uh, closure. So don't do that. Mm. 
I was hoping to be able to avoid the mirroring so you didn't have to see all my notes, but you're gonna have to see them anyway. Okay, pull them out here. Okay, so, all right, let's go into that package where we just moved those files. Okay, and we have closure script files. We want closure files. And we're also gonna want that either, right? We're gonna want that either on both sides and we're just gonna use a symlink. Uh, closure and closure script play nicely together. That's why I chose them. <coughs> uh, other languages can do that as well. Kotlin uh, is a good example. Um, so here. Same syntax, it'll run on the JVM, it'll run in JavaScript. Now I have my either on both sides and I have these uh, closure files for scoring. Um, there is one little bit of syntax that is unfortunately not the same, and that's this. So we'll just replace those, all files. And <clears throat> we wanna be able to run the tests on the server side as well. So here's line again, this is like Maven, but better and has a REPL. So now we have a task for our tests. And we get the exact same tests. Now we're running them closure instead of running them with closure script, okay? Same function, same validation, same test. Now we just moved it. Uh, okay, so, so we have this scoring package. How can, we, how can we connect it back to the client, right? Um, so we have a controller here with all of our endpoints, right? This is Spring and Kotlin, and <clears throat> uh, this, needs, this needs beans. So I have a separate configuration. I have externalized configuration to turn closure into uh, beans, and yeah, good luck doing it any other way. Um, so <clears throat> this requires a Kotlin interface for any of these beans. I have all my interfaces and use cases over here in this bowling package, we'll make a new interface, call it scorer, okay, and we'll steal the implementation from over here. Okay, and now we want, <clears throat> I shouldn't call this an implementation, steal the, the code from over here. So now we want implementation of that interface, right, and unfortunately there's still a little bit of friction between Clojure and Kotlin, so I'm just gonna put in some boilerplate if I can find the closure namespace. Okay, I'm gonna put in some boilerplate that I'm not happy about, but it's not really the focus of this talk, right? This is just converting between uh, closure data structures and Kotlin data structures. So <clears throat> this function will return an instance of score, right? And it has that score method that takes roles. Uh, now we want that as a bean, so we're gonna need to um, depend on that package and try not to mess this file up. Okay, it'll figure itself out. Nope, it won't. Okay. I don't know why it keeps jumping around. Okay. All right, <clears throat> so depending on that, and in the configuration here, uh, I'm just gonna take my, my bean from here. Okay. There, now we have that, <coughs> that scorer bean, and we wanna use it in our controller, so we want a new endpoint for scoring. All right. Previously this was done on the client, now we want this to be um, done over HTTP. So here we go. Uh, the score endpoint, and this requires um, an instance of score, so <clears throat> we do it like that, and we need to configure that. So come over here, we'll say score, and pass that in. Okay, <clears throat> so now we're creating instance, and we're exposing an endpoint, Okay, we just want to uh, build the new jar for, for this, okay? <clears throat> and 
I had set up the palm beforehand, so everything should work with that new scoring module. Um, the other thing that we're going to need to do is jump back to our uh, client side. And now, uh, instead of doing that scoring locally, we're going to be doing that scoring remotely. So we need to make an AJAX call. And I have something ready to go here. This is like a cooking show. Have everything prepared ahead of time. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you see there's saving, there's fetching, and now we have scoring and, and rolling. So all of the AJAX calls are happening right here in this file. Uh, and they're all going through a little node proxy um, that makes my life easier and just distributes based on the path to different services. Um, so, so now we have this remote scoring. and. Uh, we want to call that instead of this uh, local scoring. And so we're going to come in here. We're going to say remote score. We're going to get rid of this local scoring. Those files don't exist locally anymore. Does not exist locally. Does not exist locally. OK. <clears throat> so once this is done, we go down into our um, modulus package, and we see a push. All right, and while that is going, we can go back and talk about why I'm doing all this. So Cloud Foundry makes it so that developers do not have to think about things like provisioning VMs or firewalls or any of that low-level computer stuff. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, as a developer, I like to spend my time uh, thinking about users. right? And there's a big difference between the things that we do to satisfy users and the things that we do to satisfy computers. This is often called the value line, or uh, Martin Fowler calls it you know, strategy versus utility. Um, you could also call it uh, essential complexity versus accidental complexity. Uh, I generally side with uh, the users here. Users don't really care uh, how you run the software. They don't care uh, if it's in the cloud or on your laptop. They don't care if you have Bosch or what your manifests look like. right? <clears throat> uh, but that stuff is very important. right? And it's, I'm very grateful that Cloud Foundry is around, uh, making it so I can spend more of my time thinking about the user's needs and less of my time thinking about the computer's needs. Um, so <clears throat> so this demo that I'm doing is to show how if we isolate the stuff that is user facing from the stuff that is computer facing, then it's easier to change the stuff that is computer facing. I'm just refactoring this app a few times right, to change the deployment strategy right, without changing how a user interacts with it. OK, so that's been deployed. We should be able to um, run this with the new endpoint. And it works. Uh, also, <clears throat> credit to Oliver Gurka for the name Modulith. I don't know if he made it up, but his uh, system refactoring to a system of systems talk uh, really inspired me for, for this talk and try to show an example of moving from a Modulith to microservices uh, and then beyond. So, all right, so at this point now we have uh, the, the remote call and and that's great, but now we're realizing that the number of requests going to the uh, rolling and scoring endpoints is about 1,000 times more than the number of requests going to the fetching and saving endpoints. Fetching and saving both depend on persistence. Persistence in this module here is implemented with Datomic. Datomic has a massive peer library that is very chatty, wants to keep up with the rest of the system. So someone from the business department comes back and says, we want to be able to deploy the rolling and scoring endpoints independently so that we can scale them independently so that we don't have that extra overhead. So, OK, great. Uh, we're going to take the modulith module, and we're going to make three new ones. So uh, we're going a little bit overboard, and we're going to make uh, three services here. Uh, these are based on a book from 1974 called Composite Structured Design. And if 
by Glenford Meyer. And in that book, it talks about source transform and sync, source being where you get data from, sync being where you save it to, and transform being all the interesting things that you do with it. So we're going to keep our pure functions um, related to transform, and then persistence is uh, sync and source. So the idea being, we don't need all these endpoints for every one of these services. This one is the sync, so it's only about saving. So we're going to delete the ones that are not saving endpoints, delete the dependencies that are not about saving, go back to our configuration, delete everything except the game saver, delete everything except the game saver. Okay, and do the same thing with these other two. Okay, so this one, this is our source. We only want the fetch. Delete everything except for fetching. Okay, delete everything except for fetching. I have yet to get through this demo gracefully. I decided it was only because I don't have enough pressure. So hopefully this will help. <clears throat> okay, so here we only want the score. Roll is just a Kotlin function, so I didn't need a bean for that. And only need the score here. And score here. So the point of doing this is that I don't want the dependencies for persistence, right? Now everything is wrapped up in this beans module. Um, so I'm going to need to make a new one that does not have the persistence stuff and only has the scoring beans. So now we have a scoring beans. and do a, a little rename from beans to scoring beans so that the jar is named correctly. Okay, and inside of here, right, uh, no longer need these fetch and save. Uh, <clears throat> complaining because it's not included in the parent palm, but that'll work itself out. And we do not want the dependency on persistence from that palm, okay? And in transform, instead of depending on the beans, uh, we're going to depend on scoring beans. Okay. And at the bottom, we have some shenanigans for profiles, for a ports and adapters style approach to persistence. We need to delete that. Not interesting anymore. And we need to include all of these new things in the parent palm. So now we have a scoring beans. And instead of a modulith, uh, one more, we have these Three services, source. And while we're at it, let's just delete the modulus. Okay, gone. <clears throat> and we want to install that. So now we'll have. Duplicated. Someone has modulus. Did I not do this for all of them? Let's do this for all of them. Uh, so sync needs to be renamed sync. Source needs to be renamed source. And transform. IntelliJ is trying to upset me by renaming things. So this is our sync. This is our source. And okay. Looks happier. Okay. Uh, while that is installing, we're going to jump to our already had it right there remoting. So now instead of the modulith, we want to go to these three services. So this is for saving, that's sync. This is for fetching, that's source. And these two are transformed, spelled correctly. OK. 
Okay? And uh, the <clears throat> node proxy will take care of making sure those go where we want them to go. Um, okay, this guy is still installing. So give that a second. Uh, <clears throat> right, back to the big ideas. So, you know, <clears throat> the user facing code versus the uh, computer facing code. And I find this is very helpful. Usually, whenever I look at um, <clears throat> a line of code, I'll ask myself whether it's a user facing line of code or a computer facing line of code. And I want the maximum percentage of user facing code. Uh, one way that <clears throat> We sort of enable these two, these two, one second. Now we have our microservices. We want to CF push them. Source, transform, and sync. Um, <clears throat> I know you can't see very well, but hopefully you know what this is doing, CF push. So yeah, to enable uh, the you know, independent changes to the user-facing stuff and the, the computer-facing stuff, we <clears throat> have this idea of 12-factor app, right? And if you have a 12-factor app, then you should be able to you know, run it on any infrastructure, run it on any cloud, not really have to worry about um, <clears throat> everything, uh, everything underneath that app. Now, this really says, OK, we want the behavior of uh, the software to be a pure function of the source code, right? But it doesn't say anything about keeping state in the app, right? So you can keep as much awkward state in the app as you want. And that's fine as long as you're always deploying the same artifact, right? But once you start breaking that artifact down and you're deploying uh, bits and pieces of it here and there, right, then that state becomes troublesome, right? Because <clears throat> it's very hard to break that state apart. So I think with the advent of uh, function as a service, we should just be renaming uh, that whole thing and talk about 12-factor um, functions that are also stateless. Uh, so when, when I, I, the name for the talk was 12-factor function, uh, I felt like I was obligated to come up with at least five. Uh, <clears throat> and now, actually, I don't really feel like talking about them at all. But we can say that it should be a pure function, should be no side effects, no side causes, don't ask for more data than you need, and don't produce more data than your consumers need. Uh, okay, so if we jump back here, it looks like everything is deployed. Hopefully this still works. So now we have microservices. And they work. And can we load games? Datomic takes a minute to load up the database the first time you deploy. We can, and yeah, our microservices in the middle hooks is all alphabetized. Future feature. So, <clears throat> okay, so we've gone from client to server to microservices, and now we're actually about to add a new feature that instead of uh, fetching the games once, we actually want to refresh the games every five seconds, and. <clears throat> We've looked at user behavior and we realized that people only use the unfinished uh, bowling app um, around like 10 or 11 p.m., right? And is absolutely zero activity uh, at 7 a.m. So uh, we ran the numbers and figured out that if we deploy this as a function, then uh, the costs will be much lower uh, because the function should hug the curve a little bit more tightly. All right, so <clears throat> I have this module with nothing in it, uh, ready to go. And we're going to add a riff function. All right, and again, this is pre-prepared. Has all this uh, flux stuff. When I first wrote this, I didn't have the flux stuff. And <clears throat> it was pointed out that that is going to be an inefficient use of resources. So the flux is similar to the web flux um, that you might see on uh, Spring Reactor, uh, Reactive Stack. And we, in this case, will only need to depend on this reactor core. Uh, and we're also going to need that scoring function. So we're going to drop that in here and go back to this guy and get everyone to import. Okay. Okay, all imported. Now, 
Let's rebuild. And while that's going, we'll jump over to this uh, Rift tab. And <clears throat> let's see, what do we want to show first? So I've already installed Rift. Uh, hopefully, if you uh, attended Guillermo's talk, you understand how, how Rift is working. I'm not going to get too deep into that, but we can see uh, you can see what's there, right? So we have in this Rift system namespace, we have Kafka, we have a function controller and a topic controller for the control plane, and we have yeah, HTTP gateway and, and Kafka for the data plane. So, um, <clears throat> so when we invoke our function, it goes to the HTTP gateway, uh, and the you know function is invoked by a particular topic. Uh, it has that <clears throat> the sidecar and uh, the main app in the pod uh, talking over uh, gRPC. So there you go. That's a quick overview of how Riff works. And <clears throat> OK, this is still going. While, let's see, while we're waiting for that, let's actually do this new feature. I would normally wait, <clears throat> uh, make sure everything still works with the, the new setup before doing that uh, additional feature. But we don't have that much time. So let's see, what is my new feature? I deleted it. That's not good. Why did I delete that? OK, so this is just a little reframe code that is going to call fetch every five seconds. OK, and we're going to need, in order to make that happen, we just need to, instead of calling fetch games, call refresh games. OK. OK, we have uh, Bolarama ready to go. So we're going to do this uh, riff create function that is going to give us a Docker file and a couple of YAML files, which we can take a look at. And we're going to call this score. Oh, that's not what I wanted. I want to call this score. OK, so the input here. Uh, is that's going to be the topic that we're listening for, okay? And so this is going to create that Docker file, uh, push the image up to Docker Hub, and and then in the in the YAML for the function, we're going to have a reference to uh, that image, right? Which okay, uh, which we can. Okay. Who does not like my image? You think it's because I accidentally started the other one? All right, let's see. Uh, uh, let's do it again, but let's just give it a different name here uh, so we don't have to worry if there was something already up there. Uh, let's just call it new and just call it scores. See if that's happier. You can see what we have. Function, get a little debugging in here. And let's see. OK, <clears throat> creating container, running, not terminating, not error image pull. Hey, we got a value. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah. So this is the most graceful that my run-throughs have been, thanks to Jacques being here. 
<coughs> okay, so I did want to show one thing real quick um, while we're doing this. If we are fast enough, right, what this is creating, we can get the logs. Uh, you have 10 seconds. So that's main, and see if we can get sidecar. Okay, you can see messages coming in, 10, 10, 10. Uh, message going out, value 60, right? Uh, and those messages are going to Kafka, right? Okay, and now let's try it from here. Uh, wait, I need to change, I, I flipped that. So let's go to our remoting. And this is no longer transform score, this is requests scores, because that's the one that works, score does not work. Okay, and it will take a second at the beginning to spin that up, and then once these uh, requests are coming through, a steady stream of <clears throat> requests will, will keep the function alive. Right? That container will stay there. And there we go. That's awesome. Okay, so every five seconds it refreshes. And we save money. Okay. That's the whole transition. The last thing I just want to say, this is my scientific diagram for why pure functions are more mobile. And <clears throat> this is the image I usually have in my head because when you have an input-output relationship between a caller and uh, the callee, right, then that's an explicit relationship on both sides and it maps very nicely to request response, right? If instead you have this kind of relationship Right, where you have a caller and a callee and some ambient state, right? it's very hard to translate that into a request-response relationship. Right? If you have this ambient state, what would that be in a remote situation? It would be like, I don't know, pushing it up to an S3 bucket or something, right? and, and life would be much more complicated. Or you would just refactor so that it became request-response. Right? But if everything is always just input-output, right? input-output request-response maps very nicely. Uh, okay, I want to thank the, the Rift team for helping me out to, to do this. I had not used uh, Rift before, and they gave me some, some very helpful guidance. I think <clears throat> the, the moral of the story for me is, you know, you want that uh, sort of independence of your business logic, and the most independent you can be is to have a pure function. Uh, and that pure function should be a pure expression of uh, user-facing logic, right? Uh, the, the metaphysical part of this, uh, I think a lot about the idea of state and like the idea of state in uh, the world around us and I think that that's uh, imaginary, right? Uh, like there's nothing, there's nothing on this uh, you know, curtain here that says like it's a hash map, black, true, or color black or whatever, right? That stuff doesn't exist. And with pure functions, there's this idea of like point-free uh, syntax with, um, with Haskell that you want to express as much as you can uh, in terms of relationships, in terms of patterns, and in terms of functions, right? And not in terms of um, the parameters to those functions or state. Uh, so I think that uh, the, <coughs> the function approach is very good. You can see the same idea here with like Gary Bernhardt's uh, functional core imperative shell or with how React works or Elm works or Haskell works, right? Uh, there's nothing new in this talk but I just wanted to put it in the context of deploying things in different places. So thank you. <laughs>